want to understand. And, is this him? No, it just looks like him. Must be a twin. Um, whatever. And, and they take the man, the man who's experienced this miracle, to the religious folks because surely they're going to rejoice too. Maybe not. Verse 13. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Nobody had cared to this point. When life transformation happens, most people rejoice. It's only those who stuck in their minds and in their traditions that, that care what day it happened to be. Therefore the Pharisees asked him how he had received his sight. You put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed. And now I see an invitation to join in the joy. But the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he doesn't keep the Sabbath. And others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What do you think? The man replied, he's a prophet. In this passage, and maybe it was a chapel like this. I don't know. I'm not sure what it looked like where they gathered. It was, it was a beautiful place. To them, it was a holy place. And, and the, all the chapels were up front. And the private or the specialist comes in. And he said, man, God has done his work in me. Preacher said, hmm, we'll decide. We'll decide if it was God or not. I said, who's blind in this picture? Who's missing God here? It's interesting. If you trace the beginnings of the Pharisee group, it goes all the way back to the Old Testament where the nation of Israel, the nation of Judah, after they had split, they'd both been taken into captivity because of disobedience. And 70 years after Judah went into captivity, Cyrus released the Hebrew people to return to their homeland. And as they resettled a group of folks formed that said, we never want to disobey again. We never want to go in exile again. We never want to ignore God's word again. So we're going to dedicate ourselves. We're going to study. We're going to understand and obey this word. The beginning of the Pharisees. That's not a bad intent. Taking God's word seriously, obeying it, avoiding exile. But now... A couple hundred years later, the intent has gone awry. And I wish it always took 400 years. I'm afraid it happens much faster in many cases. How had they gotten so far off track? How had they gotten so locked in law that they missed mercy, forgiveness? And healing. Verse 18. They still didn't believe that he had been born blind and he had received his sight until they sent for his parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that he can now see? Parents' response is not bad in a sense. They said, well, we know he's our son. We know he was born blind. How he can now see, we don't know. Ask him. He's old enough. Note, it's almost a parenthetical uh, piece of information here. The parents said this because they were afraid of the leaders. They knew that anyone who followed Jesus was kicked out of the synagogue. And so they said, ask him. Put yourself in the blind man's shoes for a second. A typical day begging. A man 
stop. So it's the feast time and a, and a prophet, a well-known man that everybody's talking about and looking for, but can't find, stops and he's talking to you. And he touches you. And he sends you to wash and hope begins rising and you wash your face and all of your life's hope and dream is fulfilled and you can see and you're enjoying and rejoicing and life is amazing. And the neighbors say, eh, I don't think it's really him. And the Pharisees say, well, this man's not of God. And, and we don't think you really, you're an imposter. You're not the blind man. And the parents say, we don't know, ask him. I mean, this, this guy's going through the ringer. All he did was get healed. Now, admittedly, pretty topsy-turvy day for the parents, don't you think? I mean, we have some insight. People often thought, like the disciples, well, he was born blind, he didn't sin, must have been the parents, they must be sinful. They've lived with this all their lives. And maybe they weren't in real good standing at the synagogue, maybe they didn't have much credibility to risk. I, I don't know all of that, but I know the blind man said, he healed me and nobody is backing him up. Verse 24, a second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. Again, the blind man has a pretty good response here. Well, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind. person with an experience is never the victim of a person with an argument. If you've had a true experience with God, no mere argument can take you down. They asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He'd been through this line of questioning before. I've told you already he didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? And what does that imply, by the way? Do you want to be his disciples also? What did he not quite say, but infer or imply? Do you want to become his disciples with me? Do you want to become a disciple of his like all the others who are seeking after him? Like, like the crowds that I could hear because I sat there as non-threatening? In other words, he's acknowledging there are other disciples out there. And perhaps he's saying he wants to be one. Do you, like me, want to follow him? Then they hurled insults at him, verse 28. You're this fellow's disciple, we're disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, which is very true. But as for this fellow, we don't know where, he's come, where he comes from. The man answered, that's remarkable. You don't know where he comes from. You're the leaders, you're the religious authorities. He did this great miracle and you don't know anything about it. But he opened my eyes. We know God doesn't listen to sinners. He listens to the godly who do his will. Nobody's ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. And if this were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, You were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? Here, I think, is the answer to the question of how the Pharisees' party got so far off track. What's going on here in their hearts and minds? I mean, we, we, can't, we can't read their thoughts, but we can certainly judge from their actions. What is going on? You're steeped in sin since your birth. What are they doing? Judgment coming out. 
You were blind because you were so sinful. And we're, we're all sinners, but you were so sinful, God punished you by making you blind. If that were true, and I don't think it is at all, they seem to be ignoring the fact that now he can see. They seem to be ignoring the fact that if sin was the problem that caused the blindness, he's now seeing, which implies forgiveness. The Pharisees seem to be locked in on judgment and obedience and forgetting about God's love and his mercy. They miss the whole fact that while Jesus was in hiding, he came out to do a healing because he was compelled by the love of his Father. And you and I run that same risk. A bunch of chaplains here, there's a bunch of folks who've been in their faith for a long time, people experienced in the walk of Christ. And I say to you that we are all at risk if we ever begin to weigh judgment and, and prioritize only obedience and forget God's forgiveness and his mercy and his compassion and his grace. Jesus preached obedience, and so should we. But he preached that we can obey only because we've been washed and strengthened and rebuilt and loved on and We don't know this man's origin. I wonder if this was the wrong question. Remember the disciples? What caused this blindness? They should have, instead of thinking backwards, been thinking forward. What, what's the purpose? What is God's design? And, and the Pharisees, there's no way they could figure out where Jesus was born. They certainly heard that he'd been born in Bethlehem, but they're ignoring that. They didn't believe he came from heaven, from God. But maybe instead of asking that question, like the disciples, they should have been saying, what's his purpose? We don't know where he's born. Well, what's he doing? He's healing the blind. We read the passage from Isaiah during our responsive reading today, one of several places in the Old Testament that talks about when God's grace comes down on the earth, dramatic healing and blindness, but sight restored. Today, in this world, in 2020, the self-righteous still poke and criticize and condemn people who walk with faith. Not sure where you stand on the appointment of a new Supreme Court justice, but it's interesting that in her, uh, uh, the debate in the Senate, as she was being put up to uh, the current level of the appellate court where she now serves, and one of the senators accused her of allowing her faith to impact her life. What a terrible thing to do. People are supposed to well, wait a minute. Accusing a judge of living by her faith? And yet, there are those in our world today who feel that that's a justified critique. You can have your faith, just keep it in the four walls of the church on Sunday morning, please. Don't let it impact the way you speak and the way you operate and how you treat others and the way you vote and the way you behave and the way you expect others to behave. And if you believe the scriptures and the descriptions of the end times, the self-righteous accusing others for living their faith will, will wrap up. It's not going to go away. As wickedness increases, people will feel justified in tearing down people who live by faith. Verse 35, 
Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. The man was kicked out of the, the, the meeting with the Pharisees. They threw him out. They rejected him. Not welcome back was stamped on his ticket. And Jesus heard about it. And when he found him, he said, before we even read what Jesus said, did you catch what just happened there? Jesus heard they throw him out. They threw him out. They said, oh, that's nice. And he went about his lunch. Jesus heard they threw him out. He said, oh, we'll have to pray for him. Jesus heard they threw him out. He said, well, uh, Thomas, why don't you go try to find him? None of those things happened, did they? What happened? When Jesus heard, they threw him out. He went to find him. Jesus sought out this man. Can I say it again? Verse 1 opens with Jesus in hiding, seeing this man and being compelled to reach out to him. And again, the Pharisees aren't any happier with Jesus now. They've thrown out a man for the gall of being healed on a Sabbath day. And Jesus hears about it and seeks him out. Jesus seeks you and me. People just like us. The Good Shepherd story talks about the shepherd going after that one lost sheep. This is the story. This is one of them. Man thrown out, and Jesus doesn't finish his lunch. He doesn't send somebody else. He doesn't kick back and wait for the next report. He immediately begins looking for the man, and he finds him. There's a lot in this passage. I, I, I love John chapter 9. And we can miss a lot of the important lessons, but if, if we only catch one, we only catch one practical application today, it's that Jesus seeks us out. He is looking for you and for me. And while he may seem hidden, while, while it, we, we're blind to find him on our own, he's the one finding us. And so he finds this man. Do you believe in the Son of Man. Now, what do you suppose happened with that blind man when Jesus said these words? I, I've not been blind. I doubt many of you have. But have you heard the stories? How do people who are blind deal with life? How do they cope? What happens in them? Other senses take the lead. And I'm only guessing here, but commentators fill the, the void of, of my having to guess that the blind man was pretty good at voices, don't you think? And he remembers the voice of the man who healed him. And he's going through stuff and he's been kicked out and his parents haven't really backed him up and, but he's still loving life and life is good and he hears that voice again. He will never forget that voice. Do you believe in the Son of Man? A title given in the Old Testament for the coming Savior. He says, tell me, who is he? And I will believe. I trust you, he says. And Jesus smiles. And Je Jesus is having fun. John is having fun recording it. I think we should enjoy reading it. And Jesus says, you've seen him. You have now seen him, Jesus says. You wouldn't have seen him this morning, not yesterday, not last week, but now you've seen him. And the one speaking to you, that voice that you recognize, that's me. And the man says, Lord, I believe. This is the second crescendo in this story. The first crescendo, he came home seeing, and it's like, wow! 
life-changing. But as amazing as it is that his sight was restored, if life goes on for the man, much like it does for many of us, he might need something like these as he gets older. His sight probably didn't last forever. But this miracle, this second crescendo in the story, is eternal. Because while his sight was restored for a time, right now he gains an insight that changes his eternity. Lord, I believe. Talk about true and lasting transformation. Insight. Truly seeing and knowing. And he worshipped him. You see the progression of this man's faith? As a blind beggar, he hears about Jesus. There's some respect. He probably felt honored that this, this religious man stops and talks to him. And so there started out on a relationship of respect. And then the man touches him. He puts mud in his eyes. He says, go wash and he obeys. So it goes from respect to obedience. And then as the healing takes place and the Pharisees say, what do you think? He says, he's a prophet. So his faith is building some respect, obedience. Now he's recognizing a godliness about him. But here at the end, after Jesus speaks of them, he believes and he worships. This faith journey, all in a day, all in probably 12, 14 hours, boom. Jesus says, for judgment, I came into this world that the blind, like you, will, will gain sight, but that those who see or claim to see will be blind or be declared blind. Some of the Pharisees who happen to be there, so they kicked him out of the meeting, but a few of them are kind of wondering what's going on. What do you mean? This, this teacher says the blind will come seeing the scene. Hey, are you calling us blind? Jesus says, if you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty of sin. I would have cleansed you. I would have forgiven you. I would have washed you. I would have taken you in. We would have gone through healing together. Not that Jesus needed healing, but he would have journeyed with them to bring them healing. And he says, but because you refuse to admit, because you refuse to confess, because you're so judgmental, you're so prideful, because you claim to have so much insight, it only verifies your blindness. As I've stated, I love this story. I love the wordplay. I love the concepts battling it out, the light and the darkness and the blindness and the sight and, and insight versus real sight. And I could, every time I, I teach from this chapter, I enjoy looking for more and more that I can grasp. <clears throat> but really it comes down to the fact that God didn't give us this story just for entertainment, as entertaining as it can be. He gave us this story so that we could see, so that we could learn. And as we finish up this sermon well under an hour and a half, as we, although it has been an hour in the church service, um, not a third hour. Um, <laughs> as we wrap up our consideration of this story, what is it? Let's ask ourselves. What is it that God put this story in our Bible for? What, why did God bring this story to our attention today? What can we apply? May I suggest to you, and, and if you're following along in the handout, if I haven't totally lost you, 
points of application at the bottom of the back sheet. I've left some blanks. Uh, I've got some suggestions. You know, before my suggestions, what are your thoughts? As, as we've talked about this story today, how, what it, what's going through your mind thinking, wow, this applies to 2020 because somebody. Some are blind to what's going on. Okay. There is a blindness today, <laughs> not only spiritually, but politically in all kinds of ways, huh? socially. There, there's blindness around this world, and I'm sure we bear some of it. Or at least I do. I don't want to accuse you. What else? What else applies? Some people are still afraid like the parents. Okay, so there's fear in this world just like the parents were afraid to make a stand. What else? How else does this apply? Social injustice fueled by judgmental attitudes, absolutely. Yes? I'm sorry, I could not hear you. Okay, if you don't go with the flow, you're going you're gonna to get stopped. Any other thoughts? Here's a couple of my suggestions from the, from the back. When we see suffering, perhaps we should be more concerned with alleviating suffering. Perhaps we should be more concerned with doing what we see Jesus doing than judgment. In our own suffering, maybe we should similarly focus on honoring God. Right? Jesus said, this man, the, the purpose here was that God's works can be displayed. Maybe when we're suffering, it's more important to think, how can I display God's glory instead of who can I blame for this? Compare the two journeys. We uh, mentioned earlier, we saw the blind man go from some respect, obedience, uh, assuming Jesus was a prophet, finally admitting, acknowledging his Lord and worshiping him. We saw that journey. We also see in the Pharisees, we see this initial attitude of the debate among the Pharisees. Who is there? What's going on here? And judgment of you know, their, their particular version of the Sabbath rules and, and, and totally missing a blessing in a man's life because of the letter of the law, the way they saw it, was, was missed. And then they reject the person and they accuse them of lying. They reject the parents. They reject, they kick the guy out. And in the end, the, the represented group of the Pharisees is in denial. Oh, you're calling us blind? Which, if those are two different streams, where's our inner two? Which stream are we floating down? Is our faith growing? Or are we becoming more and more judgmental of others? Maybe we need to cry out to God for our own needs. Maybe we need to be crying for, for our sins, for forgiveness before judging others. Thought number three, <clears throat> expect persecution and judgment. When we're walking, when we have a true relationship, when God is truly making a difference in the way I live, I can expect that others won't like it. Maybe even in my own family. It's interesting to me that the Pharisees said, what are we blind to? They still thought of the formerly blind man as blind. They totally missed the work that God had done. They totally missed that, that forgiveness and healing and, 
and change had happened. Maybe they were unable to see mercy. How do you react to mercy? That's a long-term question. One last, well, two last thoughts. Literally, this man had waited all his life for his sight to be restored. How long will you trust and wait on God? God is faithful. We don't understand why it takes so long. We don't understand the ends from the beginning. You and I aren't, aren't the best judges of time and God's purposes. But Jesus came, and this man had endured a lifetime of blindness that God's glory could be revealed. Are you and I willing? Are we trusting that in our suffering, God has a purpose? And will we remain faithful until he brings it to pass? And finally, the most important lesson I think we can see in these passages. Again, if if nothing else impacts you, other than I hope this guy doesn't preach again. If nothing else lifts out of this passage this morning, I wonder if, if we can all lean with this sense that when we can't see him, when we are blind, when spiritual things are, are far from our perceptive ability, Jesus is looking for people like you and me. He found the blind man. He saw the man who couldn't see him, and he helped that man to see, and then again, he sought him out. And he said, I'm the one you've now seen. Trust me. If you feel blind, if you feel lost, if you feel alone, if you feel like others don't have your back, if you feel guilty, or judged, or sinful, or condemned, John chapter 9 repeats the theme that Jesus is looking for you. And he knows where to find you. Lord, thank you for this story today. Thank you for reminding us, for highlighting, for putting an exclamation point on the idea that you are looking for us. Not out of condemnation, not out of judgment, but out of love and mercy and offering healing. Lord, as we go out to this week, let us live in your light, in the light of your love. Amen. Please stand. We will sing our closing hymn. We're just going to sing one verse and we remember our salvation story. Very important for us. Thank you.